But let me set the story up quickly. So Moses has been called by God to lead the people out of Israel. They had been in bondage and slavery and captivity for 400 years. Pastor Daniel spoke on that. And God is called leading them into his promised land, literally the land he has promised to them. It's called the land of Canaan. So they're in the wilderness right now where the scene is before this story. Moses chooses 12 spies, one leader from each of the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes, and sends them to spy out the land. So that's where we're jumping into the story. Starts in verse 17, Numbers chapter 13. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev on into the hill country. See, somebody said see. See. What the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How's the soil, fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. Now we're gonna jump into verse 27. He gets the reports back. Specifically, he gets two different reports back. And I wanna show these two, starting in verse 27. There were 10 spies that gave Moses this account. So there was 10 of them that gave this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But, someone say but. But But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. They observed it. We saw descendants of giants there. The Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Termites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, all the ites. There were no Houstonites there. (laughs) Praise God. Then Caleb, verse 30, silenced the people. Different report. Silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Someone say, we can. can. But then the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people for they are stronger than we are. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray As we declare your word, it would change lives. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Fill us afresh today. We open our hearts and minds to receive, knowing that your word will change us from the inside out. Father, I thank you for every person here across this campus, Katie Woodlands online. Speak to us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. I don't know if you know, but there's a pretty big event coming up tomorrow. Anyone know there's a solar eclipse happening tomorrow? If you didn't, now you do. We don't know if we're going to see it because of the weather forecast. And if you miss it, the next one is going to be in 20 years, 2044. Y'all, they've narrowed this thing down to the year, the day. They even know at what time it's going to be dark in which Texas, if you didn't know, is actually a, a prime spot to see the full lunar, lunar uh, the solar eclipse. And they say that in Dallas, there's a specific time that it's gonna be dark. And I know it's because Dallas is less holy than Houston. Y'all are gonna still have some light. Y'all, my, my wife's from Dallas. Don't hold it against her. But we all know Houston's better. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Dallas is gonna be dark. They know it's a specific time. You know, I find it fascinating that the solar eclipse can be predicted to the very day, even the exact time. But we never seem to get the weather forecast right. (laughs) Weather forecast? We struggle with that one. They, They call for thunderstorms, it doesn't rain. They call for no rain, and it thunderstorms. It was supposed to rain right now. I, you guys, I'm going to give you, y'all are extra holy because you were like, it's going to rain, but I'm still coming to church today. Y'all are extra holy. You said, the rain ain't stopping me. I always thought it'd be easy to to be a a weather person. You just throw out a number. 
I'll just give it 40%. I'll give it 40%. 90%, ah, it's cloudy outside, 90%. Hey, if you're a meteorologist in the room, I do want to say we like you. We like you when you're right. Hey, in our lives, we need to be certain of certain things. And we can be certain of things like the solar eclipse being predicted at a specific year, a specific time it'll be dark in Dallas, Things we need to be certain of, things like Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that Jesus rose from the dead. We just celebrated that last weekend. Come on, give God a shout of praise, that he died and rose again, that he ascended into heaven, that he's coming back one day to judge the living and the dead. We need to be certain of those things. Now, there are other things less certain, like, let's say, the trajectory of a hurricane. We can kind of predict, but it can change. Or predicting thunderstorms. Why is that? Because there's actually so many other factors that are at play, events that take place within the environment that alter those trajectories, unlike that of a solar eclipse. It's outside of our environment, outside of our atmosphere. In the 60s, they came up with the chaos theory. And then from that, they developed something called the butterfly effect. Anyone ever heard of the butterfly effect? They made a movie on it. But it actually discusses the limitation to things like weather predictions. And there's so many factors. I'm not a meteorologist, but I did a good Google research. <laughs> factors that come into play, like temperature, air pressure, something we are all too familiar with in Houston, humidity, <laughs> cloudiness, wind, butterflies, they say, flapping their wings in the Amazonian rainforest. Not sure about the last one. The same could be said, church, hear me here. The same could be said for the trajectory of our lives. Where am I going with this? Specifically, the choices that we make, the habits we develop, maybe small, seemingly insignificant, have huge consequences on the larger sphere of our lives and our world. There are rabbit holes that we could take that could seriously alter the course of our lives and our ability to step into all that God has for us. There are choices we make. Everyone has choices and we all make them. There are choices that we make that can either steer us in the direction of God's design for our lives or divert us from his plans and blessing. It's actually what happened here in the story with the 12 spies. It was rabbit holes, choices that the 10 spies made that actually prevented them from stepping into God's promised land. As I studied this story, Pastor Daniel spoke about the Israelites wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Does anyone remember that? Maybe you've uh, read it in your Bible, the Exodus story. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. This was the exact event that caused them to wander in the wilderness for exactly 40 years. This event actually stopped the 10 spies from ever entering into the promised land. The Bible said that they died in the desert of Paran where they were wandering, and it was only Caleb and Joshua who led the next generation into the promised land. Check this out. Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years, and you shall know my displeasure. See, God took the people out of Egypt, but it took time to take Egypt out of them. He took them out of slavery but they didn't see themselves as sons and daughters of God. Took them out of captivity, but they didn't identify yet as children of God, as chosen ones. It's a process. 
and my prayer through this series is that we learn about this process, and the Bible calls it this Bible word called sanctification. Simple definition means changing still. We believe in Jesus, we're justified, but we are also being sanctified. We're being changed still. It's a process, and I hope and pray that we learn the process of becoming more like Jesus. Can somebody say amen? We're on a journey. I have a simple but profound thought that I believe is a butterfly effect in our lives spiritually, which can be a habit or a rabbit. Write this down, church. What I believe will influence how I behave. What I believe, Katie Campus, what I believe will influence how I behave. To change our behavior, we have to change what we believe. It's fundamental. We can't have behavior modification if we don't First, have heart transformation. Changes our heart. We know. Changes what we believe. Let me explain. What I believe will influence how I see. It's called perception. It's called worldview. It's how I perceive things. It's how I see situations. What I believe will influence how I see. Continuing on, how I see will influence what I say. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we know where we believe in our heart, it gets stored up. And out of that abundance, we start to speak. How I see will influence what I say. And how I talk will influence how I walk. Because what you talk out, you walk out. God is a creator God, and he created earth by speaking. He created earth and us by speaking, and we have that same ability to speak things into the atmosphere because we are made in the image and likeness of God. There's power in your words, church. I I just felt prompted. It's not in my notes. Don't curse the blessing. I don't know who that was for. There's something maybe you prayed for, but you forgot you prayed for it, and now you're cursing what God said was a blessing. Hey, following this thought, let me show you the rabbit holes that the 10 spies went down that prevented them from stepping into God's promise and provision. If you're taking notes, first, the rabbit hole of contempt, belief. They treated God with contempt. Numbers 14, 11, The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite all the things I have performed among them? Something that we learned from the Israelites is that we're a forgetful people. Y'all, I forget where my phone and keys are on a daily basis. Anybody else forget your keys and phone on a daily basis? I'm not just alone. They're literally like pointing at each other's like, that's you, that is you. Y'all, we're a forgetful people. And we can sometimes forget what God has said. And we sometimes can forget who God is. Because we are a people prone to forget. We sometimes forget to believe that God is willing and able. Y'all, we serve a great God. We serve a big God. We serve a God that came in human form, lived on the earth, lived a sinless, perfect life, died on a cross, rose from the dead, overcoming sin, death, and the grave, ascended into heaven. Y'all, that's no small matter. That comes from a great God. That comes from a good God. That comes from a God who's not mad at us, but is madly in love with us. But we can forget. Write this down. How we see God will affect how we see our situation. My my life included. God, I prayed, and it didn't happen. Should I really believe you? 
God, I read about what you've done, but will you really do it for me? Catch this. This changed the way I viewed my walk with God. Am I letting my situation determine the level of my faith? Or am I letting, come on, am I letting my faith determine how I respond to the situation? The 10 spies allowed their situation to determine the level of their faith. We cannot do it. Caleb decided to let his faith determine how he responded to the situation. He said, we can certainly do it. I want to encourage some people here today in the middle waiting for your miracle. I want to encourage you, continue to believe. Don't let your situation determine the level of your faith. Bring faith into responding to that situation. Bring faith into responding to that sickness. Bring faith into responding to that diagnosis. Come on, I'm preaching, somebody. Bring faith when it comes to believing for that child to come to know the Lord. Bring faith. Don't let your faith diminish because of the situation. Why don't you rise up, build your faith, so that we respond to the situation and say, we can certainly do it. Turn to your neighbor and say, we can certainly do it. A rabbit hole. Number two, it led to what they see because what we believe is what we see, the rabbit hole of comparison. They compared themselves. I like this one. Numbers 13, verse 31 to 33. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are, which might be true. They spread among, check this out, they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. Okay. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim, the giants. Check this last part. What did it do? We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. You know, this part interests me. They didn't yell out in their encampment spying out the land to the giants. Giants! Do we look like grasshoppers to you? Like, they're not gonna give up their position. They're spying out the land. No, they assumed. Because of what they believed, it influenced what we see. They had a grasshopper spirit. Why? Because when they saw themselves as small, they forgot that their God is big. Caleb saw that God is big and that he can surely do it. They were relying on their own strength, their own inability, their own insecurity, and that's what led them to respond with fear. I want to encourage some people here today that have been responding to a situation with fear. Let us be reminded to respond to a situation with faith. We can certainly do it in Jesus' name. Comparison shrinks us, church. Comparison leaves us seeing with a lens of insecurity. The 10 spies led out of that insecurity. They had an insecure identity, and their identity, what they believed, influenced their behavior. Belief and behavior go hand in hand. I just felt led to write this in my notes. The grass is never greener on the other side. It's only green on the side that you water. Comparison will only lead to coveting. Now, I'm not saying we can't desire things and be inspired by what others have and do. That's a different spirit church altogether. I'm saying if we aren't content with our lives because we only think it'll be better if we had someone else's, that'll steal our joy. I'm going to say that one more time. If we aren't content with our lives because we only think it'll be better if we have someone else's, that will steal our joy. C.S. Lewis said that comparison 
is the thief of joy. It's how the enemy works. It's how the enemy operates. And we know from my seven-year-old son, what do we say to the devil? Shut up, devil. We're just reminding him where he belongs, right under our feet in Jesus' name. What they believed influenced what they see. What we see influences the way that we talk. What we talk out, we walk out. Look how it influenced their behavior. Lastly, number three, the rabbit hole of comfort. They wanted something more comfortable. Numbers 14, three to four. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land, the 10 spies said, only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? They wanted to go back. They said to each other, let's choose a leader and go back. Y'all, they thought slavery in Egypt would be easier than trusting and believing God. Why? Because it was uncomfortable. Why? Because they believed they were small because they forgot how big God was. They started to see themselves through the lens of comparison, and it made them choose comfort over calling. They identified more as captives than they did children. And it was keeping them captive. It was literally holding them back. It caused them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and they stayed there. They didn't even get to enter into God's promise for their lives. Can I encourage you, church? Can I encourage you, Woodlands, Katie, online? God's call on your life isn't meant to be comfortable. If you're feeling uncomfortable in your call, you're in a good place. It's uncomfortable trusting God when we don't know how it's going to work out. It's uncomfortable stepping out in faith. It's uncomfortable doing what's right and being obedient to his word. It's uncomfortable. Sometimes comfort will lead us to go back. Some people in this room would like to go back to what once was, maybe in a marriage, I don't know why, but I just feel led to speak. You go, I'd rather not be married than be married. And there's a level of comfort, and I just want to speak. God sees your situation. It's a rabbit hole. In Jesus' name, I pray that you do not go down. Some of us in here would say, man, I'd rather go back to what was comfortable with those substances that would numb maybe some of the hurt or the pain or the things that I've gone through and experienced instead of letting the Holy Spirit heal and deal with some of those things. Wouldn't it be easier to go back to my old way of living? Church, more comfortable, maybe, temporarily, but way less rewarding. Why? Because God is calling you into a promised land. God is calling you into his plans, his provision, his blessing, his abundance. Come on, give God a shout of praise in this place. You can certainly do it. God wants to bless you. God wants to bless your marriage. God wants to bless your kids. God wants to bless your business. God wants to bless your life. He wants you to step forward into all that he has for you. Small butterfly effects, like comfort, could have huge repercussions on our future and destiny. Don't let comfort stop you from entering into the more that God has for you. I'm going to invite the team to come up and join me. So how do we develop habits that will help us enter the promises and provision God has for our lives? How do we believe and behave like Caleb? What made Caleb different? Numbers 14, 24. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit. Somebody say different spirit. I want to encourage some people here today, a relationship with Jesus, he promises his Holy Spirit. And he says, when you believe in me, you pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that you're sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit, who's your helper, your comforter, your advocate, your peace, in situations that you might be facing and going through, you have the Spirit of God. And the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Can someone say amen? He had a different spirit. People of God, we have a different spirit. He follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to. His descendants will inherit it. I love this contemporary English translation. But my servant Caleb isn't like the others. Can I speak prophetically for a moment? We need some Caleb's in Hope City Church to rise up. Joshua, your pastors leading this church forward. We need some Caleb's to rise up. Anyone name actually Caleb? You're already a step ahead, brother. <laughs> I really felt in my spirit, he's taking you through the sea and you're now on the other side and it's time to start taking territory. I wanna speak prophetically in what is going to be a future building. I love this room and this place, but it's a temporary home. We about to build something in Jesus' name. And I wanna speak prophetically. Are we saving financially, getting ready to take territory? What if we paid that building off in full? Why? Because we had some Caleb's who chose to be different, some Caleb's who followed the Lord wholeheartedly, who prioritized the presence of God in the place where he meets the house of God, the local church, what it would look like. Two things as I close. How do we do it? Believe that Jesus changed your identity. Write that down. Believe that Jesus changed your identity. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. Behold, the new is come. I want to encourage somebody here today feeling shame. The word of the Lord says, behold, the new has come. Because of Jesus and a relationship we have in him, his mercies are new every day. I don't know what you did last night, last week, last year. Behold, the new has come. Mercies are new for you in Jesus' name. Joshua 14, 7 talks about Caleb. It says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. Church, let's be a people of conviction. Let's be a people of godly convictions. Point number two, then we're gonna worship a little. Believe first that Jesus changed your identity and next, speak out who you are in Christ. Because what you talk out, you walk out. You can speak blessing in your life. You can speak blessing over your marriage. You can speak blessing over your business. You can speak blessing over the sickness, over the disease, over the diagnosis. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, I want to stir up faith for people to believe for the miraculous. Don't let contempt, unbelief hold us back any longer. How do we do it? Right here. How do we do it? Read his word. Receive his word and reciprocate his word. What if we started declaring God's word and promises over our lives, over our circumstances, over our situation? I believe we'll start to see what God sees. Would you stand with me, church? We need to believe the way Caleb did. Let us today be marked to imitate his faith.
Every day in my car, before I go to work, I just sit there and I invite the Holy Spirit of God to fill me afresh. What if we just did that right now? Holy Spirit of God, just say, fill me afresh. And he does it. He says, fill to overflowing. Right now, God's touching people. Say, fill me afresh, Holy Spirit. And in my car, God's presence fills me. And I remind myself, and I want to remind you here today, I am a child of God. I am loved by God. I bring God great joy. Someone needed to hear that today. God loves you. Why? Nothing you did. Everything Jesus has already done because he loves you. You're his child and you bring him great joy. With every head bow, eye closed. I want to invite people Provide an invitation to surrender their lives to Jesus. It's called a relationship that God made for us to believe, to put our faith in Jesus, that he's the son of God, the things we're certain of, lived a sinless, perfect life. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead so that we could have new life. That's you with all eyes closed. You want to say, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you've walked away for a long time and want to come back. Today's your day. If that's you. Would you just raise your hand and put it back down so I know who I'm praying for that says, yes, I see that hand. Beautiful, beautiful. Say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Beautiful, beautiful. You can put your hands down. We're all going to pray together, church. Everyone together. And if you raise your hand, you say it loud and proud. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you were raised from the dead. Forgive me of everything I've done wrong. Give me a new life. Today I choose to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said...